again, hello and, and, and welcome to everyone who connected today to join the sixth edition of our seminar on precision physics and, and fundamental symmetries. Uh, my name is Stefan Ulmer. I'm a chief scientist at the uh, Japanese Research Institute Riken and spokesperson of some space collaboration. I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Professor Dr. Klaus Blaum. He's a director at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg, Germany, and he will give a talk with the title Precision Mass Measurements um, on, uh, for Nuclear and Neutrino Physics Studies. Um, Klaus is, by the way, also one of the co-organizers of this seminar here. So Klaus studied physics at the University uh, of Mainz in Germany. Um, after his PhD graduation, he joined the group of Jürgen Kluge at GSI Darmstadt um, and was until 2004 working as a CERN fellow um, <clears throat> uh, and project leader of the Isotrap experiment. Um, in 2004, he became project leader of a young investigators group also located at the University of Mainz and in 2007, he was appointed as director at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg. In 2019, he became co-director of a Max Planck Frequent PTB Center for Time Constants and Fundamental Symmetry. Klaus is a very uh, well-known, recognized and outstandingly active scientist. He's a member of very different physics collaborations, um, part of many committees, and for his research, he has won several or oh, numerous research prizes. So Klaus, I welcome you here again. I think the audience is very much looking forward to your talk. And with this, I leave the floor to you. Thanks a lot, Stefan, for the, the kind introduction and the warm words you have given to me. It's my great pleasure to give the today's uh, webinar on precision mass measurements for nuclear, I added here, astro, nuclear astrophysics, as well as neutrino physics studies. I know that the, the audience is quite uh, diverse, so I will give a very broad motivation, a very broad introduction to the fields of applications of precision mass data, partly in nuclear physics, partly in astrophysics, partly in neutrino physics. I will mention all the basics of penning trap mass spectrometry so that hopefully all of you can follow up to the very end. And then of course I will give uh, a some recent results and as well as future perspectives of our field. As Stefan mentioned, the results are partly obtained within the recently launched Center for Time Constants and Fundamental Symmetries between the Max Planck Society, the German Metrology Institute, PDB, as well as RECAN, and partly also within my ERC advanced grant. Here you see the fields of applications and the precision regimes that are required for addressing different questions by high precision mass spectrometry. So here's the uh, icons for the different fields. You see the relative mass uncertainty, which I always give as delta M over M, and here the nuclides that we typically address. So for example, for chemistry, you need relative mass uncertainty of 10 to the minus five as an identification criteria. In nuclear structure physics or nuclear astrophysics, what I'm going to address, you need typically relative mass uncertainties of 10 to the minus seven. However, the involved species are almost all of them with very short half-lives down to milliseconds. So you have to be very fast with your measurement technique. Moving on in precision, I will also briefly talk about metrology and neutrino physics, where you need relative mass uncertainties in the order of 10 to the minus 10 and below. However, for species that have either a long half-life up to thousands of years or are even stable, and going to the very end of this application list, you have test of fundamental interactions and test of fundamental symmetries, like for, for example, charge parity time reversal symmetry. That's what Stefan Ulmer is going to talk about in the next seminar, as well as test of quantum electrodynamics, which I will briefly address at the end. Already here at the beginning, I would like to point out that relative mass precision of delta M over M in the order of 10 to the minus nine, so this regime here, can presently only be reached by penning grab mass spectrometry. Although there are numerous other techniques like the storage ring technique, which has done marvelous experiments in this regime here. 
why are we interested in the atomic or the nuclear mass and specifically how can we deduce that? You see here a simple sketch, so that's our atom. And the mass is given by the mass of its constituents, namely n times neutron mass, z times proton mass, and z times the electron masses, minus the binding energy. And uh, that's now, for me, always equal when I talk about high precision atomic mass measurements, it's the same as saying that we determine with highest precision the binding energy. And the reason for that is Einstein's famous equation that energy and mass are equivalent, E equals mc squared. To be precise, you see here again this equation. The atomic mass is given by the masses of its constituents minus the binding energy. And here we have to distinguish between the nuclear binding energy, which is typically in the order of a few mega electron volts over C squared. That means that we need, in order to probe the nucleus, relative mass uncertainties in the order of 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 8. That's sufficient for nuclear physics, for nuclear astrophysics, and so on. However, if you would like to probe the atomic binding energies, for example, for a test of quantum electrodynamics, and the atomic binding energy of the electrons bound to the nucleus is typically in the order of only electron volt over C squared, you need relative mass uncertainties of at least 10 to the minus 10. So depending on the physics question you would like to address, you need this or this regime here. And I'm going to address in this uh, seminar, in fact, uh, both applications. What is our working horse? What is the measurement technique? It's the so-called panning trap. It uh, consists of a superposition of a strong magnetic field and a weak electrostatic potential. So if you have an ion with a charge to mass ratio, Q over M, it can be confined in a strong magnetic field because the Lorentz force equals the centrifugal force, so, you, so the ion is orbiting here around the magnetic field lines. Strong field means, in our case, that the penning traps are typically hosted in superconducting magnets of about 7 tesla field strength. However, the ion can escape along the magnetic field lines, so in order to avoid that, and in order to get a three-dimensional confinement, we superimpose a weak electrostatic quadrupole potential by applying a voltage difference between the ring electrode and the end caps of typically the order of 10 volt or a few 10 volts. So now the ion is confined in 3D. You see here the hyperbolically shaped ring electrode and the hyperbolically shaped end caps to get an as perfect storage field as possible. Of course, due to the superposition of the electric and the magnetic field, the ion motion becomes a little bit more complicated, and this is depicted here. The ion oscillates with three independent eigenmotions. You see here the axial oscillation due to the electrostatic potential. We have now a modified cyclotron motion, modified because we do not have any longer a pure magnetic field, but we have an addition in electrostatic potential. And we get an E cross B drift term, which is referred to as the magneton motion. And here you see a sketch of a, of a, of a dry precision panning trap consisting of a hyperbolically shaped ring electrode, two hyperbolically shaped end cap electrodes, and to the fact that for the short-lived radioactive species, we have to inject and to eject them. We need holes in the end caps, and in order to make the field as, as good as possible, we add correction electrodes to the ring and to the end caps. Finally, what we are after is the cyclotron frequency which is simply given by the charge to mass ratio of the stored ion times the magnetic field. So if you would like to measure the mass of the ion down to 10 to the minus 11, you have to measure the cyclotron frequency to the same precision, but you also have to know the magnetic field strength, the magnetic field amplitude to the same uncertainty. And that's challenging. And the way to do so is that we typically first measure a reference ion with a known mass with which we calibrate the magnetic field, then we measure the unknown species, then again the reference ion, and we interpolate to the time when the actual mass measurement happened for the magnetic field. You might have noticed that the three frequencies which are given here are not the same as the one is given here. However, there are relationships between the cyclotron frequency and the individual frequencies, and among them is one which is called the brown gabriels invariance theorem because it holds also in non-perfect fields and non-perfect trap geometries. 
and uh, it says that the sum of the square of the individual motional frequencies equals the true cyclotron frequency if you take the square root here. And that's exactly what we are after by measuring the individual frequencies. We get access to the cyclotron frequency and by that to the mass of the stored ion. Here you see two experimental setups. One is a photo of the isotrap facility at Isolde CERN. Isolde is a radioactive beam ion facility at CERN where we produce radionuclides with half-lives down to milliseconds. So you need uh, quite an, a complicated environment in order to produce, first of all, the radionuclides by impinging a high-energy proton beam on, for example, uranium carbide target. Then you extract the ion species, you guide them along these beam lines, which you see here, and then you have to decelerate them, you have to cool the ion species, you have to separate them, all that happens here, before you finally inject them in the pending trap hosted here in the superconducting magnet. However, here typically uncertainties in the order of 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 9 are reached because you are limited by the half-life of the involved nuclides. If you would like to go beyond that, you have to put a little bit more effort in because you see that here on the right, where I show a photo of the Pendatrap apparatus at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics. Here we had installed, for example, a temperature regulation system that uh, temperature stabilizes the room to something like 10 millikelvin per day. You see that the magnet is uh, put on a vibrationally isolated floor. We have a pressure stabilization system installed, so all that needs to be taken into account in order to reach then finally the 10 to the minus 11 and below regime. On top of that, we are using in this experiment highly charged ions. The reason for that is that the cyclotron frequency scales with the charge state. So we can boost the precision by the Q here. Here you see a, a look uh, on our stack of penning trap electrodes. It's called pentatrap because you have five, electro, uh, five penning traps on top of each other. I can tell you to operate one trap is difficult, two is more difficult, to operate five at once is almost horrible. So you see trap number one, two, three, four, five with a total length of about 12 centimeters. And I will tell you later why we have built up this complicated scheme and how we could boost the precision uh, limit with this uh, apparatus. This was about the storage of the ion. Let me now come to the detection of the ion. And here we have to distinguish between a so-called destructive detection technique, where the particles are lost after the detection. That's mostly applied for short-lived radionuclides with half-lives in the order of a few milliseconds because they anyhow decay and are lost. So there's no need to store them longer. Later, I will introduce the so-called non-destructive detection technique where we can measure the revolution frequencies without losing the ions in the trap. But here first, the destructive detection technique based on a time of light measurement. You see here the penning trap. We store our single ion here in the center. And then we can manipulate the ion motion by applying radio frequency fields. So we can excite the ion motion to larger orbits. The, uh, the reaction of the ions on this applied radio frequency field gets measured by ejecting them from the trap towards the detector. So they follow the magnetic field lines from the strong magnetic field to a weak magnetic field because the detector is sitting outside about two meters upstream where we have a field of only a few, few millitesla. And you see here the resonance profile which we observe. So shown is the time of flight of the ions, sorry, time of flight of the ions as a function of the excitation frequency which we apply here to excite the radial modes. So the process is as follows. We capture our first ion species. We excite the ion at a certain frequency we eject the ion and measure the time of light. In that case, it's around 410 microseconds. Then we reload the trap. We slightly change the excitation frequency to this value here. We eject the ion and measure its time of light. That sequence gets repeated a few times, and that's the resonance which you observe. What we are interested in is the minimum here, because that's exactly where the true cyclotron frequency is. You may wonder about the sideband structure, 
The reason for that is that what we apply here for the excitation of the ion is a rectangular profile. And what you see here is the Fourier uh, transformation of this uh, rectangular excitation profile, which gives you the zinc function. In red, a fit of the theoretical expected line shape, black are the data points. A few years ago, we came up with the idea, instead of having a single excitation pulse, to use two of them, but separated in time. And that's, of course, known to you, the so-called Ramsey technique of time-separated oscillatory fields. And by doing so, and without changing anything, so there's no change in the, the, the detector setup, no change in the, uh, in the number of events, then you get a line shape that looks like the one here with very pronounced side bends. And that's now very good. First of all, the resonances get narrower, and the, the points here gain now more weight. And by that, we could boost the precision by almost an order of magnitude. Important to mention here is that the resolving power which we can achieve with how well we can separate the neighboring ions is given by one over the observation time. So the line width here is given by one over the observation time or the excitation time. So if we excite the ions for one second in the trap, for one second in the trap, we get here a one hertz line width. And the uncertainties we typically reach are in the order of 10 to the minus eight to 10 to the minus nine. Only a few years ago, Sergei Eliseev introduced a new technique, which is based on this de destructive time of light detection technique, but the de detector here got replaced by uh, a detector that can also monitor the position where the ion hits the detector. So it's a spatial resolving detector called a delay line detector. The advantage now is that we can not only measure the time of light, but also the position where the ion hit the detector. And since the ions follow the magnetic field lines, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the position where the ion started in the trap and where it hit the detector here. And that allows us now not only to measure the frequency, but also the phase of the ion. So we do not any longer count the number of revolutions, let's say 10 million, but we can say that the ion has performed 10 million, 10 million revolutions plus something like 45 degrees or 90 degrees. And you see here the so-called phase images of species that have been ejected with different waiting times. That's now amazing because by that we can boost our resolving power because we get on top of the Fourier limit now also the space resolution power so we can beat the Fourier limit. And the resolving power is now given by one over the observation time times the phase resolution divided by two pi. And we get clearly here a phase resolution of about three degree divided by two pi. So that gives us two orders of magnitude in resolving power and typically one order of magnitude in relative mass uncertainty. So also we have now nuclides of half-lives of only milliseconds or a few 10 milliseconds. We can determine their masses with an uncertainty of 10 to the minus 10 because of this technique here. That has really revolutionized the field. And in fact, every online facility is now using this phase imaging technique. With that, I would like to move on to the first application, we call it the topic number one, nuclear astrophysics application. So why are nuclear masses of importance for nuclear astrophysics? And I will give a very broad introduction so that you can follow uh, the, the seminar. I would like to emphasize here that I show results only of these two facilities, Isocrep at CERN and ChipCrep at GSI Darmstadt where the spokespersons and PIs are Michael Block and Maxime Hugo, but also people like Dave Lani and Lutz Schweikart are involved. And we also rely heavily on theoreticians that help us to interpret the data and especially to get then the impact on nuclear astrophysics, like by Stefane Gorielli or Achim Schwenk. More results have been obtained by colleagues from other facilities, like Yiffeltrap in Jeveskele, Python in Triumph, Lebet at Michigan State University, and CPT at uh, Argonne National Lab, as well as by two storage ring facilities, the experimental storage ring at GSI in Darmstadt and the CSRD in Manchu have contributed to that research field tremendously. Let me start with the stellar burning process. So at the moment in the sun, we have the so-called proton bur or hydrogen burning, the beta-weizsäcker cycle, which is the energy source in stars. 
So what happens at the moment in the sun is we assume that we have a pure hydrogen uh, sun is that you have the fusion of hydrogen and hydrogen to deuterium, which is called the PP cycle, with the release of energy and the positron neutrino. And it's exactly this energy that we can determine from the mass difference between the deuterium ion and the hydrogen ion. This fusion process will continue to produce heavier elements. And the next one here is helium-3, again with the release of energy. It continues with another fusion with a hydrogen atom, and you get helium-4. That sequence can go on. If you have helium plus helium, you get beryllium-8 plus 4 helium gives carbon-12, which is known as the three helium process always with the release of energy and gammas and neutrinos. Important is that the released energy can be determined from the masses of the involved nuclei. If you continue that process, and if you look on this map here, where the nuclear binding energy given an MeV per nucleon is plotted as a function of the atomic number, you will notice that the nuclear fusion process, which I have just introduced, has to come to an end around iron. Because then you have reached the highest binding energy per nucleon. And in order to go heavier, you must put energy into the system. So you can no longer take energy out. So this is called the nuclear fusion process. However, we know that heavier elements up to uranium-235 exist, and we are even using them to produce energy, for example, in power plants by nuclear fission, going from heavy systems to around iron. So the question remains, how can the heavy elements like gold be produced? Because you cannot produce it in nuclear fusion. And that's a hot topic in nuclear astrophysics. What are the nuclear synthesis processes to produce heavy elements? Why are heavy elements like gold produced at all? Why is iron more abundant than gold, and so on? These are interesting questions which we are after. To demonstrate you a scheme how heavier elements can be produced, I would like to introduce the S process. It's called the slow neutron capture process. So if you have an environment where you have neutrons available with a certain energy and a certain density, Every element has a, nuclear, a neutron cross-section and can capture a neutron. This is what I refer to here in green as the N-gamma reaction. So let's start from iron. We capture a neutron, and then we will go along this isotopic line here. So from iron 56 to 57, or from 57 to 58. That's what happens here. This is still a stable species. So these uh, black dots here are either stable species or extremely long-lived species with half-lives of, of hundreds, thousands of years. Of course, what happens here, you capture another neutron and you go to this species. You can capture another neutron and you go to this species. This now, however, is short-lived. It has a half-life of only a few minutes or a few hours. So the probability to do a beta minus decay is much higher than to capture another neutron. So what happens is that the neutron, one neutron here will decay to a proton, an electron, and an anti-electron neutrino. And that's the process how you can climb up. So you have in, converted a neutron to a proton. Now again, you capture a neutron. And then you have a beta minus decay again. You can also have a beta plus decay. And that sequence I'm now following up to zirconium. You see here, you do a neutron capture, make a beta minus decay, neutron capture, sorry, beta plus decay, here beta minus decay, and so on, and so on. And you follow the path that was a short-lived nuclei that does a beta minus decay, neutron capture, beta minus decay, you do neutron captures, and so on. And with this S process, the slow neutron capture process, you can cut, climb up, up to the heavier elements, and that will stop this process around zirconium. The reason why I stop it here is that I would like to show you two, two artifacts. And uh, the first is that if you notice here carefully, these three neutron rich elements can't be produced by this S process because this one has a short half life, it decays before it can produce this one. So these are not produced in this S process. 
neither the four ones here on the neutron deficient side, they are also shielded by the ones here. So there must be other processes that are able to produce these elements, these isotopes, I should say, as well. The path for the production of the heavy elements, as well as their abundance, that's what we're also interested in, what is the solar abundance, is strongly dependent on the masses of the involved nuclides. Other key parameters are, of course, as already mentioned, the half-life, the nuclear capture cross-section, the nuclear structure, and so on. But I will focus here in this seminar on the nuclear masses. This is the complete overview. At the moment, we know that uh, around 3,600 nuclides exist. 250 of them are stable. These are the black boxes here. All the others have been artificially produced up to the super heavy elements here, element 118, and coming back to that later. I introduced to you the stellar burning process. That's the one that's happening here, and that has to terminate around iron. And there are other processes to produce the heavy elements, like the R process, which is the rapid neutron capture process that happens in environments like the supernovae or neutron star merger, and is responsible for the production of about two-thirds of the heavy elements. And on the neutron deficient side, we have, for example, the rapid proton capture process or the proton capture process, like it occurs in X-ray bursts. Take home the key ingredient to determine these reaction paths are nuclear binding energies. Our collaboration has contributed quite a lot to that research field. You see here again the nuclear chart color coded, black the stable species, bluish the beta minus decaying nuclides, reddish the uh, orange the beta uh, plus decaying nuclides, and the red boxes are the ones if we have measured at the Isotrap facility at Isol CERN. They are in total at the moment 427 nuclides. You see here a few references of some of the recent highlights. But it's not only nuclear astrophysics that drives us to measure these nuclides with highest precision. And I would like to give a, a few uh, yeah, hints here what kind of physics questions we have addressed in the measurement of these uh, different isotopes. In the light uh, mass region, we have investigated, for example, a proton halo or neutron halos. These are very exotic systems where one or two uh, protons or neutrons are loosely bound. They are far away from the nuclear core. And uh, that's, of course, uh, fundamental inter uh, interest like bromine uh, nuclides and so on. We have performed weak interaction studies. We have discovered a new magic number. It was very important to, uh, to improve the, the shell model, which we have here in the case of calcium 54. I've mentioned nuclear, uh, nuclear synthesis processes like the RP process, neutron star physics, I'm coming back to that on the next slide, the R process, but we are, have also discovered new isotopes here in the heavy mass region by, the first, by providing the first quantity of an, of an unknown nuclide at that time, and that was the mass of the nuclide. Let me... Uh, emphasize one specific highlight, namely the importance of nuclear masses for neutron stars. Uh, neutron stars are um, amazing objects. They have a radius of typically around 10 kilometers and have uh, masses of up to two solar masses. And we are specifically interested in the, in the composition of the outer crust of a neutron star because that's where we know and we expect all the the uh, short, extremely short-lived, uh, in that case they are almost stable, but extremely exotic nuclides here in this outer crust. And the thickness of the outer crust is typically a few hundred meters. Then comes the inner crust with a thickness of one to two kilometer, the outer core with a thickness of about 90 kilometer, and then the inner core, that's probably where the quark gluon plasma of about zero to three kilometers. What is the composition of the outer crust of a neutron star. In order to predict that, using equation of states, you need to know the mass of the involved nuclides. And one nuclide that was of specific interest was 82 sync, with a half-life of only 200 milliseconds. And several groups hunted for the mass of the species, and we succeeded in, in 2013 by the first direct measurement, although the production rate is only on minute quantities of a few particles per, per second, we succeeded to pin down 
the mass to a level of below one kilo electron volt. So that's in the regime of 10 to the minus eight with this normal resonance, but also with the Ramsey resonance technique where we have reached uh, 10 to the minus eight and in 35 minutes with only 80 ions. This mass was much less bound than it was expected originally. And then uh, when our theory, theory colleagues, Stefano Gloriarelli, entered the new mass into his codes, he was able to make a new prediction of the composition of the outer crust of a neutron star. And this composition is shown here with the previous model and with the improved model by adding our new mass value. And this is to me quite, quite amazing. If you would dig a hole into the Earth's crust, you surely do not know what you get in 250 meters depth. But here, uh, our theory colleagues, they believe to know almost exactly what you get in a neutron star if you go down by 250 meters before 82 zinc was expected, but since it less bound, we know now that we can go down to 255 meters, of course, assuming a certain model that we get 78 nickel. In order to improve that further, you have to measure more exotic species like 124 molybdenum and so on. And they are getting more and more exotic more and more complicated to get access. Only recently, we succeeded to measure two other very exotic species, uh, namely cadmium 131 and 132, which is of importance for rapid uh, neutron capture studies, which got published just a few days ago. Let me summarize the present status on nuclear astrophysics, specifically in respect to nuclear masses. You see here, what is theoretically predicted are in the order of 6,000 species. Given is the proton number versus the neutron number, black ones, again, the stable ones. The red ones are the species which are involved in the rapid proton capture process. The blue ones are the ones expect, uh, are expected to be present in the rapid neutron capture process. And the brownish ones are expected to occur in the neutron star crust. What has been measured so far by the different facilities? And this is shown here. These are the number of nuclides as a function of the exoticity. That's how far away they are from stability. And the red ones are the ones that have now a known mass. So they have already been addressed by my colleagues and, and our group. The few green ones are the not yet known nuclear masses. And there are only a few. So around 98% of the involved species are now known and the mass is known. You go to the neutron star crust regime, it's a bit different. Only 50% of the involved nuclei are known. The other 50% are unknown and not yet addressed. And it becomes even worse if you go to the R process path. Here, only 1% of the involved nuclides have been addressed, and 99% is still unknown. And it's the task of these uh, teams here, which have achieved outstanding results in recent years to address that hopefully in the future. I named them again, that's the Canadian Penning Lab at Argo National Lab, the CSRE Storage Ring at the Institute of Modern Physics, the Experimental Storage Ring at GSI in Darmstadt, Eiselkrab at Isol de Cern, Yiffelkrab in the Westkelle, Lebed at Michigan State University, Shiptrap at GSI, Titan at Triumph in Vancouver, and Triggertrap at the Trigger Facility at the University of Mainz. So you see it's a quite international effort to do so. What we are looking forward is to the two next generation radioactive ion beam facilities, namely FRIP at Michigan State University and FAIR at GSI in Darmstadt, which will us provide nuclides almost of 50% of the ones involved here in the R process path. And that's really an exciting future for us to address them hopefully in the next uh, five to 10 years. With that, I would like to move on to heavier systems. And I already mentioned the heavy and super heavy elements at the very end of the nuclear chart. And here I would like to show one specific highlight, namely the study of Lorentzium uh, at 255 at the ship trap facility. Lorentzium get produ gets produced only with around four ions uh, per, per minute. Taking into account the overall efficiency, detection efficiency, stopping efficiency, and so on, uh, the, the experiment uh, guarded only about 14 events per hour. Here, the phase imaging technique was applied, and I would like to demonstrate to you what, the, uh, what, what the, the, the neat thing of this technique is. 
At the time, it was known that lawrencium has a crown state and it and, and an excited isomeric state indicated here as 255M. Which state is what was not known and also not the excitation energy. By using the high resolving power of this phase imaging technique here in the penning prep, and then ejecting the ion on the detector, you might distinguish between ions in the crown state and in the excited state. And that's what is shown here in this recording time video the data has been obtained by Oliver Kalea and Michael Block in the pair phase zero research program. So I let the experiment run. And now you see from time to time an event occurs, sometimes here, sometimes there. And here you can already feel that you end up with two spots. They are clearly separated by about 40, 30 to 45 degrees in phase space. The reason for that is that the crown state is energetically lower. So the mass is lighter, so it has gathered more phase, while the heavier species, which is in the isomeric state, has a certain excitation energy, so it's heavier, and therefore it has less phase accumulated. That's exactly what you see here. Of course, you also have to determine the center spot with no excitation, and then from that you can clearly resolve with a resolving power of up to 10 million crown and isomeric state of Lorentzium 2+. 55 mass, 255. That was the very first direct observation, demonstration, realization of an isomeric state in the transuranium region close to the super heavy region. Really an amazing result by the ship prep collaboration. With that, I would like to move on to the second topic nuclear and atomic masses for neutrino physics research. And I would also move on now here in the precision regime going down from 10 to the minus 7 and 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 11 and below. What is the fundamental interest here? Well, of course, it's the determination of the absolute mass of the anti-electron neutrino. We know from neutrino oscillations that the neutrino must have a mass, also in our standard model they don't, so that's really still a mystery. They must have a mass, and the question is, what is the, what is the mass? There are certain experiments like Katrin the Karlsruhe tritium neutrino experiment that investigate the decay of tritium to helium-3 by measuring the released, the energy of the released electron in a retardation spectrometer. By knowing the mass difference between tritium and helium-3, you get the overall available energy as the mass difference between these two species, which is also called the Q value or the endpoint energy. Minus the electron uh, mass, the, the remaining one must be then dedicated to the neutrino. And by this technique, Katrin has recently set the new upper mass limit of only 1.1 electron volt over C squared, published end of last year. Our team is interested in, in measuring this uh, Q value to highest precision, but the light masses in general. And therefore, we are using for this neutrino physics application two dedicated uh, experiments. One is the line trap experiment in mines called the light ion trap experiment with Sven Sturm being the PI. And the other one is Penta trap here at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg where Sergei Eliseev is the PI. Important to these measurements is also again theory because if we go to heavier species and to highly charged ions, we have to know the binding energy of the involved electrons. And here we get uh, Excellent support by Soldan Harman and Christoph Keidel from the theory group here at MPIK, from Moritz Habakort from the University of Heidelberg, and from Paul and Delicado from Paris. I also have to introduce here now the non destructive detection technique, which I mentioned at the beginning when I introduced the destructive detection technique. Non destructive here because the involved nuclides are long lived or nearly stable, so we can observe them. In fact, for infinite times over days, weeks, or even months. We choose the uh, Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance detection technique, which is based on the induced image current of the ion revolving in the penning trap. So, what you see here is uh, the ring electrode, which is fourfold segmented. You see the ion that oscillates, of course, in a sketch, and it induces image currents. These image currents can be measured as a voltage drop across an impedance, which becomes in resonance a real resistance, 
So what is given here is the voltage as a function of time. And then you do the Fourier transform and you get your frequency spectrum. Of course, it's rather complicated because the induced image current is only in the order of 10 to the minus 15 amp. It's a very tiny current and you have to deal with a lot of stray noise. Therefore, you need very sophisticated electronics. You see them here. That's a helical resonator, superconducting helical resonator. Uh, you, you see the, uh, the um, gallium asinite field effect based uh, amplifiers, low noise cryogenic amplifiers. All of that is operated at 4 Kelvin temperature to reduce thermal noise. And you see quite a lot of electronics, filter boards, and so on that's needed in order to detect the single ion species. But we uh, succeeded to do so. The first result that we have obtained with line trap was a mass measurement of the atomic mass of the proton. In fact, the lightest nucleus you can have. As mentioned in the introduction to determine the cyclotron frequency, you have to calibrate a magnetic field. That was done by using the, uh, the carbon 12 as the mass reference in the charge state 6 plus. So we removed all six electrons in order to get the bare nucleus. The advantage is that you come here as close as possible with the Q over M ratio. In fact, proton is the highly charged ion, highly charged ion you can have with a Q over M of 1. 12 carbon has a Q over M of 1 half, 6 divided by 12. So by measuring the cyclotron frequency ratio of these two species, uh, multiplying with the mass of 12 carbon 6 plus, of course, correcting for the missing electrons and the missing binding energy, you get the world best measurement of the atomic mass of the proton, published by Fabian Heise a few years ago, and then in a longer write-up paper published last year. And this is the present best value as accepted by CODATA. It improved the previous best value by a factor of three. We have here 15 as a statistical uncertainty on the last digit. 29 is the systematic uncertainty, mostly because of the Q over M difference and because of image charge shifts because of the high charge state. What we also noticed here is not only a factor of three improved measurement, but also we saw a discrepancy by almost three standard deviations to the previous best value. And I will address that uh, on the next, over, next to next slide. Before, I would like to show you a slide prepared by a former PhD student, Fabian Heise. He's not only an excellent scientist, he's also very much interested in science history. So he took the effort to look into the literature and dig out all atomic mass measurements that have been performed on the proton. Going back to the year 1813 or 1815. Here you see the relative mass precision as a function of the year of publication. I think he dig out more than 200 papers and uh, most of them are, are shown here. In the very early days, the proton mass was deduced from Graviometric stechiometry. Then by Aston, single focusing spectrometer was used, which was more or less a voltage measurement in a bending magnetic field. Then double focusing spectrometer. And then 1950, for the first time, a frequency measurement was performed by a mass synchrometer, where the ion made two revolutions in the magnetic field before it was detected. In the year 1989, the Nobel Prize was given to Demelt for the penning trap technique for the G-factor measurement, but then it was used uh, also by other groups for high precision penning grab mass spectrometry. And our latest value is indicated here as this red dot down to three times 10 to the minus 11. Let me come back to the puzzle of light atomic masses. I mentioned this three sigma discrepancy between our measurement of the, of the proton mass versus 12 carbon compared to the previous best values. Looking into the light masses, also deuterium, the next heaviest species, has been measured against 12 carbon by the group of Van Dijk, published in this reference two here in 2015. Green one and green indicated are our measurements, orange the ones by Van Dijk. And the third group involved here is Edmund Myers from Florida State University, who has done also outstanding measurements on this light ion species. Namely, he measured the mass difference of importance for Katrin between tritium and helium-3 by using the HD molecule as the reference ion. 
So tritium was measured against the HD molecule as well as helium-3. And he obtained a, an uncertainty in the mass difference of only uh, 7 times 10, uh, 72 pico units. So that's uh, 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 3 times 10 to the minus 11 measurement over all 70 milli electron volts is only the uncertainty. 3 helium has also been measured against 12 carbon by Van Dijk with an amazing uncertainty. All of that is in the regime of 10 to the minus 11. If you take now the binding energy of hydrogen and deuterium, you can deduce also the mass of the HD molecule. And now you get a closed loop. And that allows you to compare the measurements done here with the measurements done here. And you can perform a consistency check. And they should, of course, all agree with each other, but they don't. We see presently a 4.8 sigma deviation. That's a lot. That's five standard deviation. That's uh, out of statistics. Uh, all of them have been measured down to a few times 10 to the minus 11, but we see a deviation on a couple of 10 to the minus 11 level. In order to solve that problem, Ed Myers has recently measured hydrogen against deuterium. Our group has just finished the data analysis and has submitted a paper by Sebastian Rau on the measurement of deuterium to 12 carbon in order to check if one of the involved former measurements in this chain is wrong. And we will also soon measure directly the mass of tritium and helium-3 against 12 carbon to make this link here. And hopefully, latest by then, we will know where uh, the, the faulty past result is or what has caused the puzzle of the light atomic masses and this five sigma discrepancy. To summarize this, to summarize the, this, uh, the, our results on the light ion masses, we had uh, measured a few years ago the electron mass with an improved uncertainty of uh, a factor of 13. So this is the present best value accepted by CoData, published in these references here. We have succeeded uh, to, to get the world best uh, value on the proton mass, improved by a factor of three. And this is the proton mass given in atomic mass units published here. And we recently succeeded also to measure and to improve the deuterium mass by a factor of three, just submitted. In fact, if nuclear spectroscopy would be improved on the binding energy of the neutron and the proton, by this measurement, we would also be able to improve the neutron mass, and then our group would hold the world record for all three uh, species, which are the building blocks of matter, namely the electron, the proton, and the neuron. But still, this uh, is, is, is still missing. The nuclear spectroscopy needs to be improved. Let me move on to a few more neutrino physics applications, but this time for heavier species. In the tritium decay, an anti-electron neutrino is released. We can have a, a different decay scheme, namely an electron capture decay, as it occurs in the decay of 163 holmium. By this, you produce an excited state of dysprosium-163 until the end the release of an electron neutrino, so the antiparticle of the anti-electron neutrino. This excited state decays to the ground state under the release of energy. And this energy can be measured in an integral spectrum by using metallic magnetic calorimeters, as done in the electron capture and holmium collaboration, which is led by Loredana Gastaldo and Christian Enz at the University of Heidelberg. This is how the spectrum looks like. It's a low Q value spectrum, where the Q value was expected for many, many years to be around 2.5 kilo electron volts. And of course, you measure the released energy here by this MMC. You compare it to a direct measurement of the Q value. And the difference here, that must be the energy that is missing because of the, end of the neutrino that is released. As mentioned, the status has been that 2.5 Kilo electron volt was assumed to be the correct Q value for this electron capture decay accepted by the atomic mass evaluation. However, recent data already indicated that there might be a problem with this measurement here. So that uh, motivated us to perform the first direct penning graph mass measurement on 
Holmium-163 and Dysprosium-163. That's what we published four years ago. And our result clearly favors this uh, heavier, this, this uh, larger Q value of 2.83 keV with an uncertainty of only 33 electron volts. And soon after, the ECHO collaboration also published an MMC value with uh, almost in perfect agreement and with the same uncertainty than our value. This 30 electron volt uncertainty is not sufficient for the future generation of ECHO. So what is required is a Q value with an uncertainty of uh, three electron volt and below. And that's really challenging because the involved species, they have a nuclear mass of roughly 163 GeV, that's 10 to the 11, and you have to nail that down to one electron volt. So that needs to be a 10 to the minus 11 measurement in the heavy mass regime. And uh, in order to do so, we have started a few years ago a new project called Pentatrap, where we are able to produce highly charged heavy species in order to measure the mass of these uh, interesting nucleides. As mentioned, the, the cytochrome frequency scales with the charge state, so that's the reason why we would like to boost that here. And you have to know the magnetic field strength. And in Pentatrap, we have the possibility to cancel that out by a very specific measurement technique, which I depict here. So you see here the stack of penning trap electrodes. This is trap number one, two, three, four, five. And we use for this experiment here, trap number two as our measurement trap. And we store the ion of interest and the reference ion on the two traps of top, on top of each other. And we can always move them down. So now we measure the reference frequency by that we calibrate the magnetic field. Then we move up the ion of interest measure its frequency, then we move down again. And by this sequence, we can calibrate the magnetic field. In fact, we get kind of uh, this polynomial here for the reference ion as well as for the ion of interest. And by fitting the lowest order poly polynomial, which is here a third order polynomial, we can extract the ratio of the frequencies of these two species and the magnetic field cancels out. Of course, you might now argue, well, this is, of course, a measurement in the same trap, but not at the same time, so there might be still time variation. That's true. Therefore, we have built up this stack of five penning traps because we can now load, again, one of the two species in the third trap. It can be moved down to the fourth trap, and we can measure now in parallel in these two traps. So now we really do parallel simultaneous measurements of the species of interest and the reference ion at different positions. So they see different magnetic fields, but at least the time variation might be the same. That can also be checked by a fifth, by the fifth, by an ion at the fifth trap, which we call the monitoring trap. This is now a rather unstable one. I have to fix that at some moment. That's chittering quite a lot, but uh, this will be used in the future as a monitoring trap. Our first results are oriented towards neutrino physics. Specifically, we were interested in the Q value of the decay of 187 rhenium to 187 osmium, and we used the charge state 29 plus. So we removed 29 electrons of these two species. Again, here you see the Curie plot. We are interested in the endpoint if the neutrino mass would be zero and there would be no excited state, you would get the green line. If the neutrino has a finite mass, you get the, the red uh, dotted line and the difference gives you the neutrino mass. Unfortunately, we noticed here that atomic physics is not that easy in this specific experiment and I would like to explain you now why. First, we are interested in the Q value, which is the mass difference of the neutral atoms. However, we are measuring the mass difference of the highly charged ions. So we have to correct for the binding energy difference of the 29 electrons in osmium to uranium. And that's where theory comes in. That's rather complicated theory in order to calculate the difference in the binding energies down to the electron volt regime. And we are very happy that we have our collaborators here that are doing the, the work for us. The measurement scheme is indicated here. We have rhenium-187 in this trap, osmium-187 in this trap, rhenium in this trap. So we use 
the reference ion of, for one species for the reference of the other one because we are only interested in the Q value. We do not care about the absolute masses. We are only interested in the mass difference between these two, between these species. So we shuffle them around, we change position every couple of minutes, and that experiment was 30 minutes. We measured the three uh, motional frequencies, mu plus, mu set, mu minus, by a phase detection method, and we obtained storage times of days, and then we mostly lost one or the other species by charge exchange, still that corresponds to 10 to the minus 15 to 10 to the minus 16 millibar uh, rest gas pressure, and then we reloaded the species and repeated the experiment. What we observed in the case of rhenium 29 plus versus osmium 29 plus was that we have performed about a, a, a few dozens of cyclotron frequency ratios. We observed that for a certain species, we got this value in the ratio. And for the other half, we got a ratio which is off by about 200 electron volts. That's a 10 to the minus nine shift. And that really puzzled us a lot. And we did uh, weeks of systematic studies, whether we had chumps in our power supplies, uh, chumps in the magnetic field, uh, contaminations, two instead of one ion species in at the time in the trap. And then we came up with the idea, well, why not measuring osmium against osmium? So we loaded three osmium ions in the charge state 29 plus, measured them against each other, and we got unity, as you would expect. In the second series, we always loaded only rhenium species in the charge state 29 plus. And in about 50% of the cases, we got unity. But in 50% of the other cases, when we reloaded the traps, we got a deviation of about 1.1 times 10 to the minus 9. And then we had the idea, well, that could be a long-lived electronic isomeric state with an excitation energy around 200 electron volts. The reason for that is that now comes a little bit of atomic physics. The electronic configuration of rhenium 29 plus is krypton-like and then 10 electrons in the filled 4D shell. In fact, that's the same configuration as for osmium 30 plus because osmium is uh, one set uh, higher, so you need uh, one set lower, so you need one less electron, charge state 20, uh, 30 plus. We have figured out, we have uh, discovered an excited state where one of the electrons in the production process in the electron beam ion trap ends up in the 4F1 configuration. So we have nine electrons in the 4D9 state, but one in the 4F1 state. And that's a highly forbidden transition to the ground state. It's in fact an E5 transition and our theory colleagues have calculated a lifetime of more than 130 days with an excitation energy of about 200 electron volts. We didn't tell our result to the theory colleagues but asked them to calculate this excitation energy. And that's the amazing result of the three independent groups. This is our experimental uncertainty, 1.7 electron volts out of 183 GeV, that's a eight times 10 to the minus 12 measurement, in perfect agreement with the result of soldan Harman using QED, uh, many particle QED, Paul in Delicado, same technique, and Maurits Haberkort using density functional theory from solid state physics. That's an amazing agreement and the paper will appear in nature just in a few days from now. We did the same for a consistency check of osmium because it has exactly the same electronic configuration and also there we could find the long-lived isomeric electronic state a little bit higher in energy, which is expected due to the different Q set of, the, of, of osmium. And we have uh, also here perfect agreement between experiment and theory. What is amazing here is that we have discovered an isomeric state with a half-life of 130 days. If that transition could be used as a clock transition, it would provide a clock at the uncertainty level of 10 to the minus 26. So with this Pennygrab mass spectrometry technique, we have now opened the possibility to search for suitable clock transitions where the excited states have hours, days, months, or even years of lifetime. And I think that's the only way to detect such states. 
With that, I'm close to the end. I would like to follow up a little bit on that, what Pete has presented on Tuesday this week, namely the search for new force carriers or the fifth force search by doing isotope shift spectroscopy, which he has introduced on calcium by the quantum logic spectroscopy, where he really has presented amazing results. The quantity of interest is the isotopic shift. And what enters the isotopic shift is this mass factor here. And that's again where our measurement plays an important role because you need to know the mass differences of the involved isotopes down to 10 to the minus 11 in order to do such a beautiful linear king plot. And what uh, Pete and other colleagues are looking after is a tiny deviation from this linearity triggered by this uh, fifth force. And this tiny deviation not yet discovered to emphasize that would be an indication as it is shown here. What it requires is high precision atomic nuclear spectroscopy in order to cancel out this term here. And that's exactly what we are doing. And we have done a proof of principle experiment with pentatrap on xenon isotopic chain. Of course, for the fifth four search of interest are calcium, strontium, and terbium. These are the clock transitions. But for simplicity, we used at the beginning xenon because that's easy to produce in an EBIT uh, by using highly charged ions. In fact, I should mention that here in a collaboration, in a very excellent collaboration with uh, Jose Crespo and Thomas Pfeiffer here at the Institute. As mentioned, the mass ratio uncertainties have to be better than 10 to the minus 11. So these are the species which we have uh, investigated so far. It's xenon went 126 up to 134. This, are, this is the natural abundance. Uh, xenon 132 has an abundance of about 27%. Xenon 126 of only 0.1%. So we used an enriched sample to do the experiment. But we succeeded to measure mass ratios down to 10 to the minus 11. And you see here the improvement factor of our result compared to the previous best literature value. So our result are the zero line here. Uh, dark green, the error band is the light green, and these are the previous best values. So we have improvements even up to a factor of, of a thousand, so three orders of magnitude. And even the to date best known masses, we have improved by a factor of four to seven. This is the clear demonstration that we can do such high precision measurements also on uh, these interesting nuclides, calcium, strontium, and terbium for this kind of king plot analysis. With that, I'm at the end. My uh, one hour is over. I hope I could uh, show and convince you that uh, precision penning grab mass spectrometry has reached an amazing precision, even on exotic systems, on short-lived radioactive species, as well as on highly charged ions. It has opened up many new fields of research, and I presented neutrino and nuclear astrophysics, but also metrology. And uh, I would like espe especially to thank my team members within the division of stored and cooled ions that have uh, produced this uh, beautiful results, which I was allowed to show to you. And with that, I would like to thank the, the organizers for the invitation and you, the audience, for your attention. Uh, thanks a lot.